Uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the IOP. Uh, I'm just uh, waiting for Alan Smith to join us, who's going to introduce our first speaker. And here he is. Well, hello, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this Institute of Physics webinar, which is hosted by the uh, Herefordshire and Worcestershire Centre of the IOP. Now, uh, we were hoping that this lecture would have been a live event at the University of Worcester, where we normally hold our live events, but due to COVID Omicron circumstances, we had to opt for this virtual event, and we hope that the lack of tea and biscuits will not spoil your enjoyment this evening. Well, uh, our talk that was scheduled for the uh, 7th of December on the prediction of extreme weather by Professor Leckybush uh, from Birmingham had to be cancelled, for which we apologise, and we hope to include it later this year or perhaps in next season's programme. Now, uh, just on a point of webinar admin, uh, if you have any questions, then please include them in the questions tab at the bottom of your screen, and we will aim to collate them and put them to Dr. Booth at the end of the presentation. Well, it's now my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Adam Booth. He, Adam is Associate Professor of Applied Geophysics in the University of Leeds School of Earth and Environment. He specializes in the use of geophysical field methods uh, to image a range of subsurface targets, whether these are meerkat burrows in the South African desert, military history in Myanmar, or deep structure of glacier ice, which we'll hear about tonight. He is the program leader of Leeds Exploration Geophysics MSc program, and he convenes the Leeds-based Quantum Source series of public engagement events. Now, I suppose as we all can appreciate, predicting the evolution of glaciers is crucially important for quantifying global sea level rise. And geophysical imaging is a valuable part of a glaciologist's toolkit, allowing us to determine the ice thickness, measure the internal structure of glaciers, and characterize the interplay between um, ice and meltwater. So now I invite you to wrap up warm for physics in the freezer, seismology on polar glaciers. So over to you, Adam. Well, thank you very much for that uh, great introduction. Um, I'll just start sharing my screen and um, hopefully, uh, Alan, if you could just confirm that you can see that that's being shared. Can I stop my video? Right. Okay. Excellent. And uh, can I just get the confirmation that uh, that's uh, visible to you? That's visible to me. Excellent. Okay, great. Um, yeah, like I said, um, thanks very much for that uh, really great introduction. It's, uh, yeah, basically sums up uh, who I am and what I do very well. Um, I'm uh, delighted that uh, the uh, Institute of Physics asked me to talk to you um, today. And again, I would just echo those apologies that uh, I'm sorry that this can't be in person. Um, I was looking forward to uh, a little bit of interactivity after so much of um, uh, university activities have been brought online over the last couple of years. But, uh, you know, that, that, that's the way it goes sometimes. Um, when the uh, panel asked me to think about what sort of talk I would, I would give to you, um, I kind of had a choice about do I take you into the, the deserts and we talk about archaeology buried in the sands and meerkats digging through uh, the Kalahari Desert, or do I do something that's rather more seasonal? Um, it's uh, certainly been a really cold day in Leeds today. Um, maybe it has been where you're sat as well. Um, but uh, yeah, um, as Alan said, I invite you to wrap up warm and join me as we look at the, uh, the role that um, geophysics, specifically that seismology can play in understanding polar glaciers and, and their evolution. So um, yeah, I'm looking forward to talking to you all. Uh, please do take the opportunity to post a couple of questions in the uh, chat. And um, yeah, I'll uh, look forward to talking to you at the end. So just by way of overview, if these slides are going to move along, there we go. Um, what we're going to talk about is um, a geophysical method uh, called seismology. And specifically, we're going to be looking at um, exploration seismology. 
Um, we'll cover the, the big questions in polar science and, and what really is it that, that glaciologists in general are really trying to characterise when it comes to um, understanding the ice system. And then what role does um, do, do seismologists, the geophysicists play in, in helping predict uh, what's going to happen to our glacier systems in a warming climate? Um, I'm going to focus in on the detection of what we call ice fabrics, ice crystal structure. Now, ordinarily, uh, if you went back several decades, then people were able to measure ice crystal structure by going and sinking a borehole into a glacier and extracting ice cores. Um, but um, we can now start doing that without direct ice sampling um, and, and an entire sort of geophysical way of uh, assessing the, the ice structure. Um, and I'm going to take you on a virtual trip to Greenland. So indeed, uh, do think warm thoughts and wrap up warm as I'll uh, take you to look at the, the deployment that we did on, um, on Greenland's store glacier um, using some really cutting edge fibre optic uh, seismic technologies. Um, just to extend a little bit about what uh, Alan was saying about my own history, um, I am a geophysicist through and through. And I say that because um, a lot of people who enter the geophysical field do it um, through a physics route, for example, or a computer science or maths, or maybe they take uh, geology or geography. Um, whereas um, for myself, I started in Leeds in 1999 doing um, the BSc in geophysical sciences. Um, thereafter, I um, took the MSc in Exploration Geophysics and I've come full circle and as Alan said, I am uh, now the, the programme leader of this MSc. Um, I then worked in the resources industry for a year uh, before returning to Leeds to um, undertake a PhD in, in another branch of geophysics that we call near surface geophysics. The clue is really in the name, but it's kind of engineering applications of geophysics. The, the part of the Earth's surface that really influences the day-to-day -day activities, the engineering situations that, that we encounter as, uh, as, as human societies. Um, my first foray into the world of glaciology came when I took a research postdoc position at Swansea University in Swansea's glaciology group. Um, researchers there had recognised that um, the techniques that I was developing for archaeological imaging could be very well scaled up to the, the glaciological situation. And so I was able to take a, up a research position there. Um, thereafter, in 2012, I did three years at um, Imperial College London as a research and teaching, teaching associate before returning to Leeds uh, in, uh, in 2015 as a lecturer in exploration geophysics. Uh, finally, I was uh, promoted to Associate Professor of Applied Geophysics in 2019. So you might get a little bit of a history that um, I'm not just a geophysicist through and through, I'm um, a Leeds geophysicist almost through and through. Um, and certainly um, I have found Leeds to, to be um, a really conducive place to doing both kind of fundamental and um, applied geophysical research in, in a range of different disciplines. Uh, just to touch on what those disciplines are, like I said, I, I did my PhD in, in so-called near-surface geophysics, and one of the, um, one of the main uh, recognised focuses of near-surface geophysics is archaeological imaging. Um, if you've ever heard of the term geophysics before, then maybe you've heard it abbreviated to geophys uh, through programmes like Time Team, um, where they're looking for archaeological remains in the ground. And so this, for example, is a project that we were doing a few years ago um, outside of the village of Elsica, which is um, just outside of Barnsley. And this was an old uh, Victorian um, industrial site. What you're looking at here is um, a, a kind of gas holder that was built around the, the turn of the, uh, the 1900s and was demolished to some extent in the 1980s. Um, the kind of the map that you can see there is um, a, a kind of scan of, of the old um, site workings. And there's a big question about the foundations of, of this particular um, feature in the site and to what extent are they still present in the ground? Was the entire gas tank left there and just covered over or was the site completely remediated? 
we came along with some geophysical imaging methods and this is the sort of data that we get. So you can see very prominently in, in this ground penetrating radar image, um, effectively using radar waves like an echo sounder, that um, we've got this very clear circular response in, um, in the ground. And that is exactly where the, uh, the old map workings would suggest that the, um, the gas holder was present. So th that's the brick perimeter wall. When we combined it with a few other imaging methods, we were able to prove that the tank is no longer there. It has been backfilled, but nonetheless, this perimeter wall still exists. Other applications of near surface geophysics, um, I've started moving in more kind of ecological directions. One of the beauties of geophysical imaging is that you can see what's going on in the ground without having to dig that ground up. You can leave it completely undisturbed. So in the case of this site here, there could be all sorts of um, you know, industrial contaminants and things around the ground that you might not want to disturb. But equally, when it comes to ecological targets like this, um, this is a geophysical derived um, image of a meerkat burrow. Now, of course, you could go along and excavate that meerkat burrow and find out exactly what the, um, the geometry of it is. But that's, you know, <laughs> that's bad news if you're a meerkat, suddenly your home gets excavated and it's not the most ecologically sound way of, of studying animals. So um, we came along with radar and we were able to map out the, the, the subsurface distribution of this meerkat tunnel. And this was actually featured in um, a BBC Nature documentary called Animals with Cameras. Um, it is available uh, if you go on to uh, BBC iPlayer or whatever their format is called. Uh, but equally, if you were to go on your search engine of choice and type PBS, uh, Meerkat Wave Technologies, uh, then you can see a little bit of an overview of what we were doing with, um, with our radar system and our application to, to mapping out this Meerkat tunnel network. But of course, taking you to Kalahari is far too unseasonal for this time of year, and we're talking polar glaciers. Um, but just before we go there, I just um, want to kind of, <laughs> if we were doing this live, I would be polling the audience at this point and saying, so what, what do you think of when I say seismology? And I'd maybe take some uh, audience views, you'd put your hands up. And my guess is that the majority of you would probably say earthquakes, and you'd be right. Certainly, um, when we think about what's going on with earthquakes, um, we're looking at various tectonic forces in the ground. Um, as uh, you've got whole sections of the ground that are grinding and sliding past each other, um, there's a buildup of stress, and at some point that stress will give way, and you will send a seismic shock wave into the ground, a set of vibrations that we call earthquakes. Um, of course, it's not only uh, earthquake plate motion that generates seismic energy. Um, this is, um, as I'm sure you've, you might have seen in the news over the last week, um, this is um, a, a, a photo of the, um, the Tonga volcanic eruption. So the various rumblings that are going on um, in Tonga are picked up at seismic monitoring stations in, um, in the Cascade Mountains in the US here by uh, the US Geological uh, Survey. And so you can see that um, there's a time axis along the bottom of those two graphs that spans about two hours. And so there's a, an increase in, um, in seismic motion as, um, as, as the rumblings of that vol volcanic eruption um, really take hold. So these earthquakes will will go, well, they'll travel all around the world and um, yeah, they, they represent a hazard, but they also represent a, a valuable source of information about the structure of the ground beneath our feet. Um, of course, it doesn't always have to be uh, tectonic action, it doesn't always have to be volcanic action. Um, this is anthropogenic noise, the famous Vardy quakes. So um, this was uh, data that we recorded in 2016 when um, the crowds in Leicester City's um, uh, Premier League winning year um, generated seismic energy that was recorded on University of Leicester um, seismic arrays, um, generating an earthquake of magnitude 0 0.4, I think the, uh, uh, the figures go. Now, obviously, that's not going to not going to damage any buildings but that's simple people power that is generating noticeable seismic energy and you can see that there are large bursts there highlighted in red as various teams score um, and um, you know you, you can do examples of backyard um, backyard seismic survey um, what I've got here that um, you know 
that is a Lego size monitor. So if I was doing this um, in person, in uh, in the uh, with, with you live, then we'd hook this up to a laptop screen and I'd get you to, to make some body quakes. But, you know, feel free to explore these. You can get them online. You can get them from um, the, uh, the British Geological Survey. They come in boxes like that. And so you can set one up in your back garden and measure uh, your own seismic motion. Uh, so uh, plenty of stuff that we can do with seismology. Um, like I say, geophysics is all about imaging the ground beneath your feet without having to go down there and dig it up. And so there are geophysicists who will use these um, seismic recordings to actually image the Earth's structure. Uh, what you can see there is a schematic diagram of um, earthquake waves traveling within the upper um, the upper part of, of the Earth's mantle. Um, but it's through the use of um, earthquake seismology that we know, for example, that um, there is a layered structure to, to the Earth. We have an inner core um, in which seismic energy travels very, very quickly, suggesting that it's uh, very, very dense in there. We have an outer core that we know to be liquid, for example, because certain seismic waves will, will not travel through liquids, um, so-called seismic shear waves. Uh, that rely on shear motion, um, fluids do not support shear motion. So the fact that we know that um, shear waves don't travel in that um, outer core, we know that um, it must be a liquid outer core. And then we can probe the various uh, seismic strength structure of um, the Earth's mantle. So that's kind of planetary seismology. I kind of go one step slightly further shallower than this here. So if I was to repeat this experiment, um, where I ask you, what does exploration seismology mean to you? Then I would suggest that maybe you're thinking now, and indeed, um, if we were doing this live, um, you might struggle a bit more with this particular definition, but I imagine that given enough time, I would start to tease out some answers. And you might start suggesting that we're thinking about the resource industries. So certainly things like oil exploration and hydrocarbon exploration. Um, here is an image of um, the structure through uh, the Central North Sea done by the, the seismic contractor PGS. And that's imaging um, the Earth structure down to around eight kilometres or so. Um, the colour coding that you can see here relates to seismic velocities. And certainly um, certain seismic velocities are indicative of certain geological materials. Um, you can see some of these things that are um, pointed out here. Um, you've got this kind of like pink coloration. Um, seismic velocities, maybe in excess of 5,000 meters per second, uh, are indicative of geological materials like chalk. Um, these slower seismic velocities, maybe approaching you know, 2,000 meters per second, um, is more kind of unconsolidated sediments, sandstones and shales. And the reason why we're so interested in data like these is because um, a lot of these geological structures um, contain hydrocarbon reserves and moving forward um, they may become uh, future repositories for um, carbon dioxide storage. So moving from um, uh, the, the use of these geological targets as a resource and actually um, redeploying them, if you like, as um, a, future to, uh, a, a future solution for um, climate change scenarios. So here, what we're doing is um, effectively using seismic energy like an echo sounder. Now, that's partly underselling some of the, the, the technology, some of the mind-blowing technology that goes into making images like this. And certainly, at least for the last few years, if you look at um, industries and applications that um, take up supercomputer time, then the processing of these industrial seismic data sets uh, is within the top five applications, other ones including sort of weather forecasting and monitoring of processes within, um, within nuclear facilities. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, the, the sophistication in some of these seismic imaging technologies is, uh, is really quite astounding. Um, but at the heart of it, it is an echo sounder. And so what I'm showing here is a, an example of a marine seismic acquisition where um, a, a various set of uh, seismic sources are towed behind a survey vessel, along with a whole set of, of receivers of seismometers, much like the Lego one that I just showed you there. And energy gets fired into the ground. It reflects off all the geological layers and comes back to the surface where we can record it. 
that's an example of a marine seismic survey. Uh, we can also do things on land. Um, this is an example of uh, what we call a vibrosized truck. It's a truck that um, basically <laughs> vibrates the ground. Um, it jacks itself up uh, onto that central plate uh, so that there's a lot of, you know, a big lot of weight sat on top of that central plate. And then it starts to oscillate that plate, generating seismic energy and allowing us to record structures like that. Now, like I say, um, a lot of these methods were initially developed for hydrocarbon exploration, um, potentially one of the sources of, of problems when it comes to climate change. But that whole technology, a lot of that data is being repurposed uh, for a much more kind of energy futures application. So um, there are companies now that will specialise rather than looking, say, eight kilometres into, um, into the geology beneath the North Sea. They're looking within the top 20 metres or so uh, because they need to be able to engineer the foundations of, of wind turbines, for example. Um, whether you're going to like lay cables across the sea surface, all that sort of stuff, the site investigation that goes into it uses these same kind of echo sounder based techniques. And that's one of the things that um, in Leeds we're particularly keen to promote. Um, we've recently opened our, um, our geo solutions centre. So repurposing what geoscience is, what geophysics is for. Um, yes, there is resource exploration you can do with it, but it also moves into um, energy futures. And indeed, it also helps um, with understanding the consequences of that kind of exploitation of, of hydrocarbons uh, throughout the last few decades uh, by, by helping us um, to, uh, to understand the evolution of the glacier system. So this is where the talk moves um, into, uh, into the frozen regions and, pardon the pun, we start putting the ice into seismology. That's a, a pun that works much better spoken out than it does written down, but there you go. Um, understanding the propagation of seismic waves through through ice has shed some really essential light on glacier structure and the processes that glaciers are undergoing. And the importance of that is really kind of underscored by these three diagrams here. Now, um, <laughs> the zoom control bars for me are slightly obscuring the, the dates across the top of these images, but moving from left to right, um, you have a, um, a, a developing picture of the surface elevation of the Greenland ice sheet. Um, it's colour coded by how much does it change over the particular archive. And this, I think that the first image is um, an archive 2003 to 2006. The middle one is 2006 to 2009. And uh, the one on the right is 2009 to 2012. And what you can see in there is that there's a progressive lowering of the surface elevation of the Greenland ice sheet. And that's all caused by increasing melt. So normally we expect that um, glaciers are what we call mass balanced. They have as much um, input in the form of fresh snowfall as they do uh, in uh, snow and ice that is melted away over the course of, of the summer season. And a healthy glacier has, um, ha has a positive mass balance, so it's accumulating more snow than is being melted off. Unfortunately, we don't see many, um, many glaciers around Greenland that are exhibiting that behaviour, and many of them are in negative mass balance, meaning that they're, they're losing more ice mass, contributing more water to the oceans, than what they're gaining. Um, so this is imagery that is derived, as you can see at the bottom there, using various kind of satellite platforms. Now, satellites are great for telling us all about the kind of surface processes that are going on in the glacier, um, at the top of the glacier, but they are less good about telling us what lies beneath. And that's really where um, geophysical imaging, where seismic imaging comes in, because it's not only about the surface processes, it's about the internal structure of the ice. It's about the meltwater that is interacting with the ice in the very deep parts of, um, of the glacier. And we need to understand the whole of that system. So why is it essential? Understanding ice structure is crucial for modeling ice flow under warming conditions. For example, because under warming conditions, we'll get more meltwater produced. Now that meltwater will eventually find its way from the ice surface all the way down to the very bottom of the glacier. So how does the ice interact with that increasing amount of meltwater? 
what does the glacier sit on? What lies beneath? Because if that meltwater comes down and um, the, the ice is sat on frozen bedrock, then you'll find that that meltwater can kind of very quickly lubricate ice flow and all of a sudden psh, the glacier speeds up uh, as it starts to slip over its bed. But if the uh, water encounters uh, sediment into which it can percolate, then maybe we can store the water down there and the interaction with the ice will be rather less. But altogether, we need to understand um, these, the, these, the, the interplay between these different processes so that we can get accurate models of sea level rise. So if I take you on our first, uh, first virtual field trip to uh, a glacier, I'm gonna build up a schematic model that will show you um, the anatomy of um, a Greenlandic glacier. Now, anywhere in Greenland, you could find ice that is up to three kilometers thick, and at some point that ice will sit on a, a bed of sediment, maybe, and at some point it will be underlined by, by crystalline bedrock. I would say that over the last like 20 years, our understanding of what, um, what the glaciers sit on uh, has really, um, really been overhauled. I think that a lot of initial models just assume that ice would sit on rock, uh, whereas actually we're, we've imaged that um, there's, there's quite a lot of sediment uh, also uh, beneath uh, the glaciers there. So um, that's like your bog standard model. But of course, as I just mentioned, that there's some potential that subglacial water could be stored within this sediment. Not only that, at some depth, the ice will reach its, uh, its pressure melting point and you can actually get um, liquid water stored within the kind of intercrystalline spaces within the glacier. Um, and that starts to kind of lubricate ice flow as well. Um, I think the statistic goes that as you increase the water content in a glacier from zero to 1%, you increase the strain rate by 400%. So there's really quite a, a sensitive relationship between just a small amount of water and really quite accelerated ice movement. At some point, we'll also, um, uh, we'll also develop one of these flow fabrics like what I talked about before. This represents an alignment of ice crystals that's all of a sudden are much more um, able to flow in a given direction. So we need to understand um, if we're going to predict the whole of the, the whole flow of the ice system, we need to understand the concentration of englacial water and its distribution and also whether we've got these kind of aligned ice crystals that will promote fast flow. Now we might come along with our seismic survey set up. Uh, we, we bring geophones to the glacier, much like the, uh, the Lego one that I showed you there, but looking a bit like this. Um, they're they're kind of like a microphone really. It uses the similar principle that if you have a magnet moving within a, a coil, you will generate an electrical current. So the ground does the movement, there's a coil inside that center there, and um, it sends off an electrical signal uh, through that cable and into your recording system. And in that way, you. Um, you, you measure the, uh, the, the, the seismic motion of the ground. Um, and that is, um, yeah, well, maybe about that big or so. We make sure that that spike is kind of nicely coupled into, uh, into the ice surface. Um, we then come along with um, one or another type of seismic source. We basically make our own earthquakes and we send a shockwave into the glacier. And just like using those echo sounding techniques, we start to build up uh, a picture of the glacier there. And so this is a little example of some work that we did on Greenland where we're really just mapping out the topography at the bottom of the glacier, but we also get some sort of sneaking uh, ideas that there are maybe some sediment pockets underneath the glacier as well. Now that's kind of imaging that kind of like uh, the subglacial topography is, is definitely important, but I'm much more interested in, in a quantitative use of um, of the seismic methods to actually get some ice physical properties out of our data. Um, so what can we do to that end? Well, usually we measure the speed of the seismic energy, uh, how, how fast the energy is traveling through the ice. When I was showing you the geological examples, I was saying that certain um, certain geologies might be associated with uh, certain speeds of propagation of energy. And when it comes to the glacier, we normally expect that our um, seismic energy is going to travel at something like 3,850 meters per second. Um, slower speeds can be indicative of englacial water because the speed of seismic energy through water is 1,500 meters per second or thereabouts. So you can imagine that as you start to make a blend of solid glacier ice and a little bit of water, 
Um, overall, you slow your seismic energy down that little bit. And we can measure um, changes in, in the speed of the energy in that way. Now, faster speeds, though, can be associated with these flow fabrics. And so in the next slide, just wanted to highlight a bit about where these fabrics come from and um, what it is about the ice that, uh, that gives us these um, changes in, in speed. Um, so here is uh, at the bottom of the slide there, you can see a, a scanning electron microscope image of um, some ice crystals. Um, you can see that they are, um, they're quite regular hexagonal crystals and they're what we call anisotropic, uh, which means that the seismic velocity through them varies with direction. Um, so, for example, if we take our little ice crystal there, um, if I've got seismic energy that is traveling along the plane of that crystal, then it's going to travel at something like 3,800 meters per second. But if we send the seismic energy in the kind of uh, the up-down direction with re respect to the plane of the crystal, then it's going to travel more quickly um, and it might travel as fast as 4,050 meters per second. So, like I say, there's this directional dependency into, um, into how fast the seismic energy is traveling. So what does that mean about what we measure in the field? Obviously, we're not measuring things at the scale of individual crystals. But of course, when you put all those individual crystals together, you get a glacier. So what is the structure of the glacier like? Let's say that we've got ice crystals with no real um, preferential alignment to them. They're just randomly aligned. The red arrow there is showing kind of the fast propagation axis of, of these crystals. Um, and because they're randomly aligned, all you get is the average velocity through them. So um, you, you, this is the situation in which you measure a speed of 3,850 meters per second with your, your seismic energy. But let's say that we now have a situation in which one of these flow fabrics has developed. There's something about the way the glacier is flowing that has caused all of the ice crystals to align. Um, let's say, like in here, all of the ice crystals have been aligned, so they're fast axes. Are all pointing up. That means that when we send energy across that glacier, it's going to travel at the slow seismic velocity, but when we send it up and down through the glacier, it will travel at the faster seismic velocity. And so characterizing how seismic energy um, changes speed with direction can be a really good indicator that we've got one of these strongly anisotropic fabrics that has developed, a hint at what the glacier's internal flow conditions is like. And certainly if we start seeing velocities that are in excess of 4,000 meters per second, it's a really good indicator that we've got one of these fabrics developed. So um, understanding fabric is tantamount to understanding flow. The flow history of a glacier is preserved in the strength of any one of those fabrics. And that's really vital for predicting ice dynamics because you could measure the flow speed of the glacier from satellites, but there you're only looking at the surface conditions. Through the geophysical imaging, you're able to say much more about um, the internal flow of, of the glacier and how it's interacting with materials that it's fed. Seismology allows that to be done, but without an ice core. Remember at the start, I suggested that um, previously we've seen these flow fabrics by um, putting a, um, a, a borehole into the ice and extracting um, chunks of ice from it. Now, as logistically demanding as it is to actually go out and do geophysical fieldwork in the field, um, it's much more demanding to also go and recover ice core while you're there. So if you can avoid doing, um, doing ice core, then, um, th then you would, and geophysics is a great way to do that. So with that background done, I'm now going to take you into the field. Um, this is um, a project that I was really lucky to get involved with um, back in 2019. Um, and it was on um, a glacier called Store Glacier in, um, in the, the west part of Greenland. Um, Store uh, just means large within uh, in Danish. Uh, so <laughs> it just means the, the large glacier. Um, many of the glaciers in this, this region are very, very large. Um, it's one of Greenland's biggest iceberg factories. Uh, certainly ice that reaches the fjords um, becomes icebergs and sets sail into the sea. And of course, that's the mechanism by which Greenland ice is, is contributing to sea level rise at the moment. I've highlighted a couple of the major towns in Greenland there. Uh, what you do is you fly into uh, Kangaluswak, which is a major airport hub, and then um, we take a smaller plane out to the town of Ilulisat. Um, 
so this was the, the last uh, deployment that I did before lockdown. Certainly um, the pandemic put paid to a lot of our um, geophysical experimentation on ice. Um, but, uh, so <laughs> that's why I feel really lucky to have got involved with this one. Um, what we were doing was deploying seismic instruments in a borehole. So rather than just at surface, we actually, um, we actually drilled a borehole into the ice to get some real kind of close contact with the ice that we were trying to measure. And we did that in a, a one kilometre um, borehole so that we were effectively getting a virtual ice core. We weren't um, extracting ice from that borehole, but by having the seismic instruments directly in contact with, um, with, with the ice that we're studying, we effectively treat it like it's a, a virtual ice core. Um, what you can see in the image, uh, the kind of colourful one down at the bottom of the slide there, is, is the flow velocities of the Greenland ice sheet and of Storr Glacier um, in, uh, in metres per year. So overall, um, it, Storr Glacier is a fast flowing outlet of the Greenland ice sheet. And at our site, which is marked by the annotation L028 there, the ice is flowing at something like 600 metres per year or but roughly uh, two metres a day. So if you were stood observing something away from the ice, um, you would see crevasses moving in front of your very eyes. And certainly over the course of the week, uh, you've moved you know, roughly 20 metres downstream. So it's really quite a dynamic environment. Um, it's in important to understand the evolving ice losses uh, of this glacier uh, from uh, the overall Greenland ice sheet um, and its interaction with meltwater. Now, the other annotation on that figure there is um, star S30. And this was where some other work had been done by, um, the, uh, by, by the Responder Project and uh, the Alfred Wegener Institute. Um, one of my colleagues, Kuhn Hofstetter, suggested that there would be a flow fabric at this site um, and that we'd likely encounter it at, at 800 metres depth. But um, these were relatively rough estimates. So can we improve on that? Can we do this direct imaging of one of these flow fabrics and prove what's going on at depth within this glacier. Before we go there, I'll do you a quick tour of Ilulisat. This is what Ilulisat Airport looks like. Uh, there's one of my colleagues, Andy Clark, uh, posing for me. And Ilulisat is really um, rather a pleasant town to, to be in. Um, it's uh, right on the coast. You can see there that as well as all these kind of uh, the, these boats and yachts that are in the dockyard there, there's also a couple of icebergs that have come in. Um, these are quite small ones that are on their way towards melting, but um, nonetheless, they do cause some obstacles every now and again for people wanting to, to get their boats out. Ilulisat is um, on the, on the, the Jakobshavn Isbray uh, fjord. And um, when you walk slightly around the bay, you discover this. Now, I already said that um, this this whole part of West Greenland is is an iceberg alley. Um, it is a um, an iceberg factory, and and what you can see there is the the fjord uh, next to Ilulisat. It's completely choked with icebergs. This isn't terrestrial ice that you can see. Um, this is floating ice that that is all kind of um, maybe partly grounded at the moment, but is ultimately on its way uh, into uh, into the North Atlantic. And just for a sense of scale. Um, some of these icebergs are absolutely enormous. Um, there's a small tourist boat that has come out uh, whale watching and going looking at icebergs. So uh, really the, the, the scales of ice that is coming out of, um, of the Greenland ice sheet here are, are really pretty uh, staggering. The way that you get up to Storr Glacier is by helicopter. So uh, we load various bits of equipment into the helicopter and indeed personnel and we fly out to Storr Glacier. This is a so-called carving front of Storr Glacier. It's uh, not quite as impressive as the fjord as uh, I showed you before from Jakobshavn Isbray, which is a real monster of, of an outlet uh, from, uh, from Greenland. Um, but nonetheless, uh, you can see that there are some icebergs coming off the front of Storr Glacier here. Now, at this point, Storr Glacier is really, really crevassed. The ice is flowing so quickly that it's kind of exceeded the tensile strength of the glacier and it has started to crack and crevasse. And this is not a particular place that you'd want to be doing geophysical surveys. Um, it's downright dangerous. Uh, but fortunately for us, further upstream, 28 kilometres upstream, um, the, uh, the glacier surface is much better behaved. And this is the first view of our camp that we got as I landed in, in that helicopter. Um, 
nicely uh, already set up for us and good to go. So this is uh, in, an indication of some of the, uh, the drilling apparatus that we use. Uh, this is um, the, uh, the toy of Professor Bryn Hubbard, who is a, a professor of glaciology at Aberystwyth University. Um, Bryn's apparatus is a hot water drilling system. So you can see here that you've got the, uh, the drill tower with uh, a cable going over it. And if you follow that cable back over, the, uh, over these, these pulleys and systems here, uh, it goes into this big spool of cable and then it feeds into these kind of like these black boxes that you can just about see over here. And, um, it, you know, it uh, doesn't take away from the sophistication of the equipment, but what these are is a uh, Karcher pressure wash, pressure wash systems. So um, the, uh, the water is heated, it's pressurized and it's sent down uh, that drill uh, stem um, where there's a hot water drill system at the bottom and it kind of blasts a vertical hole uh, through the glacier. Um, there's lots of meltwater to suck up uh, at this particular time. You can see that there are streams coming through here. Um, if I just play this video here, this is a, what we call a moulin. Uh, this is um, a way of channeling meltwater from the surface of the glacier uh, to depth. So if I just press play on this video, you can see that there's really large volumes of water headed down into the kind of internal plumbing system of the glacier there. Um, and indeed, that's one of the reasons that we chose this site for the study, because there is this big input of, of meltwater at this point. Now, one of the things I point out here is that this red cable drum you can see, that red cable is fiber optic cable. And we were trying out a really revolutionary way of, um, of, of recording seismic data. And I'll just say a couple of words about this because it's, it's technologically really exciting and really interesting. Um, rather than using our conventional geophones that are these kind of moving coils that, that, um, that, that produce an electrical current and thus record the, the seismic energy, um, what we're doing is using um, a fiber optic way of doing this. So it's expressed in this kind of schematic diagram that you've got here. Um, what we've got is a sophisticated computer that we call an interrogator. And this is connected to a length of fiber optic cable. And that fiber optic cable has um, a laser pulse that is continuously fired into it. Now, the walls of that fiber optic cable are not perfectly smooth. So via Rayleigh backscattering, certain components of that laser pulse are um, backscattered to the computer. And the really kind of mind blowing thing about this system for me is that even the kind of really small vibrations that a seismic wavelet represents um, are enough to kind of deform the cable so that the backscatter characteristics of that laser backscatter change and the interrogator can reconstruct the seismic response for you. So um, where, where ordinarily we're only able to record seismic data where we can put one of our geophones, we can now record seismic data wherever we can deploy fiber optic cable. And I literally mean any fiber optic cable. We could come along with um, Leeds's brand new interrogator that we've just bought, and we can plug it into a home fiber optic broadband system. And with that, we can start to monitor the seismicity um, in the cities beneath our feet. So, um, yeah, it, it's really exciting technologies, and we were really keen to kind of try out um, this, uh, this system. Uh, in, in the glacier setting and what we ended up doing was the first deployment of it um, within a, a glacier borehole so it was really exciting. Um, some vital statistics there, uh, kind of almost marketing spiel but it gives us continuous sampling in time, something like a, a recording of the seismic wave field every one meter and like I say it's this very flexible survey geometry wherever we can put a fiber optic cable we can start to um, measure seismic responses. So what did we do? Um, this is a map of all of our seismic shooting locations and in the very middle of that in orange is the borehole location where we installed the fiber optic cable. Um, again there's Andy Clark uh, looking at the, uh, the seismic data coming in um, and all of these little spots are like I say shooting locations. Now I've showed you before that we can do marine seismic surveys, we can use one of these big trucks to vibrate the ground. The seismic uh, source that we used was me with a sledgehammer. Uh, so um, yeah, <laughs> a seven kilogram sledgehammer and over the course of a four day experiment, I did around 2000 shots 
around the place and um, really ruined my back. Um, so I, I suffer for my science, but um, and so as such, I have the privilege to play that video again. Um, but yeah, um, really successful experiment. It turns out that you can indeed shoot through um, one kilometer of ice using just a seven kilogram sledgehammer. And here is the proof of it. Here's the data that we get. Um, this is a so-called vertical seismic profile. Um, a little bit counterintuitively, um, we conventionally plot depth on the x-axis where you'd actually think it'd be better on the y-axis, but there we go. Um, and what you can see is um, this really prominent arrival that's sort of streaking in a rough straight line um, uh, down the length of the cable. And we're measuring the travel time that it takes that energy to arrive at the different bits of our fiber optic cable, all the way down from uh, surface at zero depth uh, to uh, just over one kilometer. And I've shown this schematically here. It's this big uh, red arrival that uh, is our main arrival that we're really interested in. And these subsequent ones that you can see kind of like uh, a slight ghost of them there, I think are arrivals that are scattered from crevasses in the area. So energy doesn't only go down the cable. When I smack the ground with a sledgehammer, it kind of goes off in all directions and it will bounce around and rattle around the various crevasses that, that we've got there. But what do we do with these data? Well, um, I want to measure what the seismic velocity looks like and velocity is distance over time or depth over time. And so by looking at the variation of, of um, the recording time of this seismic energy coming down the length of our cable, I can start to build up a picture of what the seismic velocity variation is within the glacier. So what I'll say is that building up a, a glacier schematic here is that for most of the glacier, particularly through its upper 750 meters or so, we see a relatively constant um, seismic velocity. There is some noise on this particular plot, but it's a constant velocity of around something like 3,700, 3,800 meters per second. But look what happens when we pass 800 meters and certainly when we pass 900 meters we start to see these really high seismic velocities that are indicative of these, um, these aligned flow fabrics. But then at the greatest depths, we also see that seismic velocity starts to come down a little bit. And the most efficient way of doing this is to have um, liquid water within the glacier at this point. So from, uh, from this survey alone, we're able to get um, a really high resolution picture of um, the internal structure of Store Glacier. Now, is there anything we can do to back this up? Well, um, it turns out that as well as being sensitive to, um, to seismic responses, this fiber optic cable and, and the backscatter that goes on in it is also sensitive to temperature changes. And so we also analyzed the, the uh, fiber optic cable um, for, for, for temperature. And this was done by um, a PhD student, Rob Law, at um, the Scott Polar Research Institute. And so um, there's my seismic velocity profile with depth. And in these um, uh, charts marked A and C um, are Rob's temperature recordings. Um, now, what I'd say is that the greater the deformation in the ice, the, 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 the more quickly it's flowing, uh, the more heat is generated internally within the glacier. So you can see that there's a nice correlation between my velocity profile and particularly below 800 meters, uh, this rise in, um, in the end glacial temperature. And finally, we reach a temperature that plateaus at the very deepest part of the glacier, um, and that's where um, the ice would be at its pres uh, pressure melting point. So it really is quite plausible that we would have um, liquid water inclusions in the deepest part of the ice here. And so, like I say, this is a, a virtual uh, geophysics ice core without having to um, recover and transport and preserve um, a physical ice core. So um, we were we were really pleased with the um, with uh, the way that this system worked and and the new capacity that it's offering um, geophysicists in in the, their task of understanding ice dynamics and how they're likely to evolve with, with climate warming. We can also do time-lapse sampling. Um, we can just leave uh, the, the system doing its own thing, sat there listening out for the natural seismicity of the glacier. This can change. Um, what we've got here is a similar record to what I showed you before, but this is really early on while the fiber optic cable is still freezing in place. And so I kind of 
you know, this is maybe one hour after we installed the fiber optic cable. And every now and again, I was coming back and taking repeat shots. And you can see the evolution of that structure as the cable starts to get frozen in place and effectively locked in to the glacier ice. You can see gradually the data quality improves um, and then we reach the, the image that I showed you before. So if we just play backwards, you can see all this kind of noisy part of the data here is where the, um, the, the cable is not uh, welded in place within the glacier because it's not frozen yet. It's just kind of flapping around in the water column. But then the data quality improves as that freezing takes place. So that starts to give us an indication of things like um, the, the thermal diffusivity uh, through the ice. So um, by looking at, simply looking at the data quality, we can show where the glacier um, is freezing more quickly th than elsewhere. And um, maybe that is also indicative of, um, uh, of the ice dynamics going on in there. And then we have truly sort of passive responses. What you'll notice about all of these um, responses that we see from my, my sledgehammer impacts on the ice surface is that the seismic arrival follows that straight line. But here we have a curved arrival. Um, the apex of that curve is indicative of where um, seismic energy has the minimum travel time. So that, because it's this curve and has um, the peak of its apex at something like oops, sorry, at something like 300 metres depth, that suggests it's a, a natural seismic emission from within the glacier. So um, likely um, a crevassing event or something like that. And I've got a PhD student at the moment, Andrew Pretorius, who is taking an in-depth look at these data using kind of uh, machine learning methods. The full data set that we acquired is something like uh, nine terabytes or so over four days. So uh, it's a massive archive for, for Andrew to be looking at. And so um, machine learning methods really come into their own there. So where do we go from here? Um, my current projects are looking at um, seismicity within Antarctica. And we have had quite a lot of disruption to, um, to field campaigns here, but um, I'm part of a project that is um, a component of the International Thwaites Glacier Collaboration. Uh, Thwaites Glacier is an Antarctic glacier, and if you've seen about it in the news, then you might have seen it expressed as the Doomsday Glacier, which is a little bit of a dramatic name for it. But um, it is a, um, a glacier where th there is some real concern because um, the, the dynamics of Thwaites Glacier um, very sensitively affect the overall dynamics of, of the West Antarctic ice sheet. So um, the Thwaites Glacier collaboration brought together um, science capacity from the UK and the US, merged it together, and there was a number of projects that were um, dedicated to the study of Thwaites Glacier. Um, here are the ones that I've highlighted, if you go and take a look at this website, um, find out these particular projects. These are the ones that are specifically using um, seismic and other geophysical methods to try and understand that glacier system. I'll just give a shout out for my own project. We are part of um, the TIME team. Uh, so uh, the Thwaites Interdisciplinary Margin Evolution. What we're really looking at is how are the edges, the margins of Thwaites Glacier going to evolve as, um, as, as the glacier system starts to, to speed up in response to climate warming. So um, do keep your eyes peeled. I've just had a survey team come back from Antarctica and they're um, currently undertaking some well-earned leave. Um, but uh, in the next few months, we're going to be taking a look at the, the data that they recorded. So um, that's kind of it for the uh, for the ice geophysics. But um, I did just uh, have permission from uh, the IOP panel just to, to give a couple of plugs. Um, the first is um, if you've been inspired by uh, this talk and some of the uh, the applications of physics that you can do, if uh, you're someone's currently thinking about your A levels or um, future MSc, you know you're a physics undergraduate at the moment, then do take a look at some of the courses that are on offer at the University of Leeds. Like I say, I'm the program manager of our Exploration Geophysics MSc, and we'll give you a full training in um, the use of geophysical methods for a range of subsurface settings. Uh, really, the world is your oyster once you've got uh, the toolbox of um, geophysics methods under your belt. And if you've been inspired by Antarctica more widely, then I would also put in a plug for my um, quantum source outreach project. If you were to go online and search quantum source Antarctic adventures, 
then you would find uh, me having an interview with um, a scientist from the British Antarctic Survey, uh, Dr. Alex Burton Johnson, um, and he's talking about um, the, the geology of Antarctica, and he also brings in some of his own um, kind of geophysical data sets that he's been looking at. So uh, with that, though, I will say thanks both to uh, the entire um, Responder project team and also to the panel for inviting me along. Um, I really hope you enjoyed this talk and I look forward to taking your questions. Thanks very much. Uh, well, Adam, thank you very much for uh, your talk. I found it absolutely fascinating. Brilliant. Um, and the thought of you standing on the ice sheet, hammering away with a sledgehammer, caught my imagination and I think one or two of the other people in the audience. Excellent. It's certainly one good way to keep warm, I'll tell you that. <laughs> well, it, perhaps one of the questions was, um, why don't you use something more sophisticated than a sledgehammer from Alex Wood? Perhaps yeah, that's I mean, the answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. It's a really good way of keeping you warm. Um, I th I, certainly, there are other surveys that do use um, much more sophisticated methods, um, possibly much more scientific, more repeatable than, um, the, than a sledgehammer. There are pros and cons to these. Um, certainly if you look at some of the capacities within Antarctica, then the Alfred Wegener Institute, the, the German equivalent of the British Antarctic Survey, do have one of these um, vibrator trucks um, mounted on a um, whole kind of like piston bully set up uh, to traverse across the ice shelves there. Um, and they go along doing the kind of more conventional land style acquisition. Um, another good seismic source is explosives. But what I would say in particular about the, um, the vibra size truck is that it's absolutely enormous and it's a really real pig to transport around. And so if you're working over um, a glacier terrain that is um, either crevassed or it's got even remotely like the undulations that you can see in the background of that image there, then the vibra size truck is simply going to bog you down. Um, the nice thing about a seismic sledgehammer source is that it's very, very portable. And so if you've got to kind of move around the glacier, um, you don't quite know what route you're going to be able to take because you don't know what the crevasse situation is like, then simply being able to throw a sledgehammer over your back and move around the glacier is actually very convenient. Um, one thing I also would say about the general kind of scientificness, the repeatability of the seismic source is that um, the sledgehammer is actually pretty repeatable. Um, it encounters problems where you have a snow surface that's very deformable because if you imagine you've got an impact plate, every time you hit it, it's going to slightly move into the snow and compress the snow a little bit. So yeah, there you have problems with your repeatability. But on a solid ice surface, you're not going to be deforming that ice at all. It's, it's almost like smacking it on concrete. So actually, as long as you've got a consistent hammer blow, it can be very repeatable. So it's a compromise between your survey logistics and uh, the data quality you actually want to get out. And I think that Sledgehammer isn't bad in, in this particular situation. Thank you. That's a very simple explanation. And I think keeping warm is also important. <laughs> One of the questions that come, follows from that is, is there a limit to the depth of a glacier, both in terms of uh, how deep they actually can be and in terms of how deep you can drill? That, that's an interesting one. Um, in terms of a theoretical limit on how deep a glacier can be, um, I guess it depends what um, how much uh, ice melt you, you get over the course of the ablation season. And certainly um, going back through ice ages, glaciers were much more widespread. Um, I honestly don't know if they were significantly deeper. And I can't think why. I mean, they're, they're a gravity flow, right? So at some point you're going to have um, uh, 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 a, a given thickness of ice that will just start to flow under its own weight. So I guess in that sense, it might be um, a self-regulating system. But certainly during the ice ages, even if they weren't significantly thicker, glaciers were much more widespread. Um, and then the other question was, is there a limit to how deep you can drill? Um, I would say that time is one of the big limits. It depends what you want to do. Um, certainly, the drilling of a borehole and extracting ice cores at the same time is really rather time consuming. And the problem that you have is that these glacier systems are so dynamic that if you start to drill an empty hole um, through the glacier, 
Um, by the time you reach the bottom, it'll have closed up at the top and it will have entombed all of your valuable seismic equipment and you don't want to do that. So when people are drilling these really deep bore holes all the way down to um, the bottom of the Greenland ice sheet, three kilometers, and, and they have indeed done that, um, what they do is they tend to load the borehole um, with an inert chemical um, that uh, matches the density of the ice so that that tendency of the ice to close up um, doesn't happen. So you basically have neutral density in the borehole. But it is a logistical challenge. Okay, uh, thank you for that. A follow-on question from that is another one from Alex Woods. Um, well, two questions he has. One is, um, how do you know which part of the fibre uh, of the optical fiber cable is returning any given laser pulse. Mm -hmm. And then the second one is, how do you remove the cable once it's frozen in? Okay, um, I'll, I'll answer the second part first, and that's, um, you don't. Um, it, it's locked in there, but um, I guess that means that it, it then represents a natural laboratory that you could always come back to and, and, and do kind of um, more time-lapse studies uh, from one year to the next. In terms of um, the how do you know which part of the cable is responding? That's all part of the, the interrogator system and the way that it analyzes the data. What we know is we know the precise time of transmission of, um, of the laser pulse. And we also know how fast the laser pulse is traveling through the fiber optic cable. There's an air gap in the fiber optic cable, so it's traveling at the speed of light. And so as backscattered components are coming in, it's looking for differences in that backscattered component. And it's basically timing the, the transmission, uh, the time, it's timing the delay between the transmission of the laser pulse and when um, changes in the backscatter arrive. And because we know that um, the speed of light through this fiber optic cable is constant, then you'd always expect um, there to be this constant relationship between the travel time and the, the distance along the cable. Right, yes. Um, as, a, as a laser physicist, I can, I can relate to that. Okay, great. <laughs> I should say uh, I am not a laser physicist, so I am <laughs> glad that you can relate to that. <laughs> right. Um, now coming back to Derek Walker, um, how did the profile through the glacier change through the year? Have you been able to measure the pro changes in the profile? I think we really would have liked to have done, but obviously with, um, with, with lockdown, we're not able to, to go back and certainly, um, yeah, the, it, it would have been nice to go back there and, and check it out. But, uh, you know, international travel bans and things like that meant that um, I wasn't undertaking any glacier field work at all. What I do know is um, the, I was there on the feet in the field for about a week. Um, and the rest of the team stayed on for quite a lot longer. Um, the guy in the picture you can see there with um, the kind of circular design on his black t-shirt, um, that's Rob Law. And he was uh, the guy undertaking the temperature measurements. And he was there for quite a lot longer. So they left the, the temperature center recording for a month until um, the point at which the cable snapped. Um, because at some point the strain is so much that it will just tear the, the cable apart. Um, and the glacier doesn't evolve very much over that period. Um, what Rob showed is that, you know, there, there are particular bits where the, the temperature in the, in the borehole reaches equilibrium uh, more or less quickly. Um, but what we do know is that in terms of the, the changing seismic response in the glacier, when we leave the cable just recording background seismicity, there's some indication that there's um, a diurnal cycle to the seismicity. What I mean by that is that um, if you imagine that you're on the Greenland ice, ice sheet there, and even though it's basically 24 hours um, daylight, um, the sun does have more energy in the middle of the day, so it's making more meltwater. So those moulands, those, those drains through the, uh, through the glacier are um, much more active during the day. And all of that meltwater rumbling through the glacier and causing the glacier to, to speed up um, gives us a stronger sense of, um, of seismicity, of seismic emissions um, through the day. And then as the sun, well, sets, or at least gets lower in the sky, um, 
the um all of that meltwater production slows down the glacier kind of goes goes quieter and the size misty dampens down again so um yeah th it does seem that there is this uh, this cyclicity to um the seismic responses thank you um another question i have and that is you talked about the um orientation of the water crystals mm. um saying that you got a fabric when the crystal started aligning mm. i presume they don't um they don't actually move physically do they is this the water melting and then refreezing in some way yeah so as you start to strain the glacier you get strain heating that will cause the ice crystals to to, to recrystallize so yeah oh. it, it's not a, a mechanical rotation it's a, a recrystallization into a preferred axis right okay yes that okay. makes sense yep. yeah um and um and basically you're saying that they that if you think of the the crystal as being a hexagonal rod mm. the high velocity is along the axis of the rod yes. and the lower velocity is across the is orthogonal to the axis yeah absolutely um and so you know you do get some really complicated flow structures and and flow patterns um for the point of view of kind of like trying out equipment in the first place, we're quite fortunate because here um, it's a really rather um, simple flow structure where all of those, um, the fast axes of the ice crystals are all aligned and, and they're pointing vertically. But there are other scenarios where ice is, say, you know, deforming in a different way. It's flowing around something where you get these so-called kind of girdle fabrics. And so not only will your um, velocity change depending on the or the the um the direction through the crystal it will change depending on where you're looking at it because um as you go across the wet the, the length of a glacier for example you will move to a different part of that fabric so your fast axis will swing around so um yeah there's some really quite um uh, complicated uh, seismic interpretation that goes into these data sets sometimes so is that what you'll be looking for when you go to the Thwaites glacier then do you think it's one of the things we'll be looking for. Um, we don't have um, the capacity to install a fiber optic system within Thwaites Glacier. So we're doing something that's a bit more um, kind of geophysically conventional in that we'll take our normal geophones and we'll, we'll cover a, a 3D patch of the glacier in. So, so instead of having like just a single profile through the glacier, we'll get a, a volume of the glacier that um, is being imaged. And what we want to do there is we think it's likely that there is going to be one of these flow fabrics um, within the, the deeper reaches of the glacier. But yeah, how does that change over the shear margin? Um, the, the thing about these Antarctic ice sheets and likewise store glacier as well, is that it's not like looking at a glacier that you might imagine in the Alps, let's say, where you have the ice that is um, you know, entirely surrounded by a mountain. The outlet glacier is a fast flowing part of an overall ice sheet. And so there's a, a shear margin that marks the onset of fast flow. And so there's a big change in the kind of um, uh, the ice crystal structure across that shear margin. So, yeah, that, that's what we're looking at is what is the behavior of, of the ice at depth on one side through and on the other side of that margin. Right. Thank you. Um, I'll return a question from Der Derek Cunningham. Mm. The diagrams of the Greenland ice cover height measurements seem to show a decline in height followed by a rise for the latest 2009 to 2012 image. Has that trend continued and is the balance of snow cover to melt improving? Um, okay, let's just flip back to that, uh, that image there, if you just bear with me. Uh, oh no, I've gone past it now. Haven't I? <laughs> Sorry, there we go. Um, so yeah, okay. I guess in the um, in the final image there, you're seeing a, a little bit more of this green colour through here. So suggesting there has been potentially some recovery. Um, I think it's um, it's important to recognise that um, throughout Greenland and, and many of our glacier systems. Um, you might see these kind of like localized recoveries here and there, but as a whole, um, the, the loss of ice and the lowering of that surface um, uh, greatly outweighs the, the, um, the recovery, if you like. Um, so even though it looks like you've got these kind of 
positive mass balance across the, the northern part of the ice sheet here. If you were to kind of integrate this image, you would find an overall um, negative picture. So um, I, I don't think it's right to say that that trend has, has continued. If there's any one trend on here that's continued, it's the, the growing kind of intensity of the uh, red colours uh, around the periphery of the ice sheet. That's where it's going faster. That's where the that's where there's more melt happening. Yeah, so um, you know the, there is um, a, a growing impact of of warming. Right now, one of the questions that uh, Alex Woods has asked is: You showed an ice quake, an ice berg, sorry, that had floated into the harbour. What do the locals do about it? <laughs> do they have a? <laughs> I, I don't know. I, th I don't think there's very much they can do about it because um, some of these things are really, really big and uh, it's not like you just kind of like tow them out because uh, they're all sorts of weird shapes and sizes and you're only going to get snagged up in it. Um, I think they see it almost as just um, one of those things that you've got to live with. Um, I guess, uh, yeah, if a massive iceberg comes and clogs up your harbour, um, there's, there's no amount of, of towing you're really going to be able to do to get rid of it. So I guess you just have to wait it out. Um, yeah, but some of them did complain that, you know, oh, my, my boat got wrecked by, by the iceberg that came in the other day. So, uh, yeah, it's an occupational hazard of living there, I think. <laughs> Alex has got two more questions. One is, why do you plot the depth on the x-axis in your graph? <laughs> uh, is there a specific reason? Yeah, there is. Um, I, I, hopefully I'm not going to kind of overcomplicate this. There, there is a very good reason. And that's that if I just flip back to the image of the, the seismic data through the North Sea, um, just bear with me. Um, what I've done here, or rather what PGS have done here, is to take this colour coding and to use the, the velocity information uh, to do a depth conversion. So here we're looking down the y-axis here and we reach eight kilometers depth. Um, ordinarily, just like our seismic recordings um, on, on Store Glacier, what we're actually recording is, is the travel time of the seismic energy. So in its rawest form, this would be a y-axis in time, not in depth. Um, now, these uh, the vertical seismic profiles that we're recording on Store Glacier, um, as a technique and as a method, they were developed by the hydrocarbons industry. And so um, the kind of the plotting format that they use has kind of like just, it, it, it's a convention and that is stuck. And the reason that they plot um, the y-axis as time and the x-axis as depth is that when they process their vertical seismic profiles, they want to compare them directly to images like this one. So if this image which is the bread and butter of the, the seismic imaging industry, has a y-axis in time, then so should the vertical seismic profile so that you can compare these two data sets more directly. Um, and, and that's it, really. It's just a convention that is then stuck. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's as much as I can say. Right, thank you. Um, another question from Derek Cunningham. How do you remove false seismic vibrations from your sledgehammer hits? Um, I understand glaciers are very noisy already. Um, yeah, they are. Um, I guess one of the, um, let's forward all the way. So I'm going to do this uh, slide where I had our, the end glacial seismic events and my, um, the, the data from my seismic impact. So um, this is a good image here. Um, for a start, um, the, um, the seismic events that I generate with the sledgehammer, at least from some of the initial analyses that we've been doing, are rather stronger than some of the um, englacial seismicity that we record. So a simple amplitude threshold is sometimes um, all you need. The other thing that we uh, as geophysicists are always looking for is not just kind of the arrival time at any one data point. We're also looking at the apparent curvature of the seismic wave field. So for example, this is, um, it, it does have some little variations of wiggles on it, but overall that is a really rather straight linear trend uh, uh, between, between depth and time. Whereas a lot of these end glacial seismic events, because they originate at some depth within the glacier, the way that they are perceived by 
um, the seismic cable uh, by the fiber optic cable is as a curved hyperbola. Instead of having your, uh, hopefully you can see my video with the with my fingers, I, I um, just pointing out the, the cable orientation. If we've got a seismic shot here, all of your seismic energy that you're interested in is traveling up and down. So it just has a linear um, so-called move out, a linear travel time characteristic. Whereas if you've got a seismic event that's off over here somewhere, um, that is within the glacier, then its travel time is effectively swinging around the hypotenuse of a triangle. Um, and that's what gives this hyperbolic characteristic in the data. So we're looking at general amplitude characteristics. We're also looking at wavelet frequency characteristics. And we're looking at um, the, the kind of the shape that some of these uh, arrivals define. And, um, you know, th there is an element of getting to know your data and um, just simply being experienced with the interpretation of seismic data. Obviously, that's um, when I say we're going to look at this in a machine learning way, um, the better we can train the machine learning algorithm to recognize what's genuine seismic data and what's, say, background noise. Um, uh, it, you know, it's going to be a really important consideration, but uh, yeah, hopefully that gives you some insight into how we do it. Well, that does lead on to Alex Wood's next question, yeah. which is, what is the greatest distance between one of your seismic sources and seismic detectors in practice and in theory? Uh, in theory, um, how big a sledgehammer do you want and how much workout do you want me to do in advance? <laughs> uh, what I do know is that um, probably the, yeah, the furthest offset between a source and a receiver that I've ever acquired with a hammer and plate um, was maybe you still see some hint at it at two kilometers. Um, but this is a relatively shallow glacier uh, that was maybe only 200 meters um, thick. If we just step back to my seismic image, uh, sorry, my, my seismic map of the acquisition, um, then yeah, so all of these seismic shot points here, um, the, the red dots move along these lines up to a maximum offset about 500 meters away. Um, and you can just about, in a really good shot record, still detect um, seismic emissions from 500 meters away at a depth of um, one kilometer. What I would say is though that um, we can go further than this um, because we can record energy that goes down, but also you can see energy coming back up that's reflected from the glacier bed and is then sort of bounced back up the cable. So if you imagine that if we shoot here at the borehole, um, I will shoot energy and it will travel 1000 meters or so through the glacier. And then it will bounce back up and we can maybe see it to a, a return depth of 500 meters. So perhaps for this setup, we can maybe detect um, my seismic shots to something like a maximum of 1.5 kilometers away. Okay, that's quite, quite a depth. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I did get the nickname, the Thor of Store in this particular project. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Oh, certainly keep your fit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I just, I, by the end of the uh, the four days of seismic shooting, um, I wasn't able to to lift any boxes or anything like that. Sadly, I wasn't able to help pack the camp up, so I had to sit and, and watch everybody else do it. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but I'm just, before my next question, I was just going to say to the audience, if you've got any further questions, please... Um, I'll put them in the question and answer um, tab and I will uh, be able to address them or, or I will be able to put them to the speaker, to Adam. Uh, next question uh, is from Alan Smith on the panel. Mm -hmm. um, are there any advantages to using ice penetrating radar to study deep glaciers? Uh, yeah, there are. Um, so the, the radar methods that I showed you for the, uh, the near surface applications, I've also done quite a lot of radar studies um, on, on glaciers. Um, are there advantages? Uh, yes, there are. Uh, for a start, you can, um, you can put it under the wings of a plane. Um, seismic methods are all kind of contact methods. Uh, you know, you, you can't go around doing an airburst of explosives in the air or something like that and expect to record um, good seismic data from, from underground. Um, but you can put radar antennas under the wings of a plane and you can fly across the whole of the Antarctic continent, the Greenland, uh, uh, the Greenland ice sheet, and you can map out ice thickness. Um, 
it does have some drawbacks and that's that it doesn't give you much indication of what's going on beneath the glacier. Um, what tends to happen is that when you get into um, the subglacial environment, um, your radar energy is very quickly absorbed. One of the things that absorbs radar energy is um, materials that are electrically conductive. And what you find about these subglacial sediments, um, all the clay minerals that are in there, um, all of the impurities that have been kind of frozen out of the um, of the glacier ice and are now concentrated within that um, subglacial environment, um, it makes the subglacial environment rather electrically conductive. And as such, you might get good imaging all the way through the glacier, um, but you're not going to get a lot of insight into um, what's going on in the subglacial environment. Now, when people say to me, what's your favourite geophysical technique? Um, I don't really have one. And that's because I'm a big advocate of acquiring multiple geophysical techniques, multiple geophysical data sets over any one site. Because what you're, when you're um, using seismic methods, you, you're sensitive to the seismic properties of the ground. But if you can bring in radar, then you're also sensitive to the electromagnetic properties of the ground. And so any of the ambiguities in any one geophysical data set are overcome when you combine these multiple geophysical data sets together. And so um, there was also some radar work going on at the same time when we were doing these seismic surveys. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm a big advocate of, uh, of, of blending different techniques together. Mm, yes, I can see the advantages, as you say, combining the, uh, the radar, getting more uh, a broader set of uh, radar data to complement um, specific um, seismic uh, studies. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's exactly consistent with the kind of archaeological work I did before, because um, with that um, example of the, the, the buried gas tank, um, what we did was a radar survey to image the, 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 the periphery of the tank itself. But knowing that if the tank was there, it would be metallic, it would be electrically conductive, and so we wouldn't see through the tank to actually prove it was there. What we did was a gravity survey, so um, effectively a geophysical technique that weighs the ground. And so if you imagine that you've got this tank in the ground, you'll have a void, and effectively um, you've got a mass deficit within the ground there, and our gravity instrument can, can sense that difference. So again, um, bringing radar together with gravity insight you, you get that much more holistic picture of what's going on in the ground. All right. Okay. Um, I think it's probably going to be the last question, but uh, another question from Alex Wood. In normal times, how many tombs are out in Greenland and elsewhere, uh, I presume, doing glacier surveys? Yeah, so all of the big, um, all, all of the, the national uh, glaciological institutes, so British Antarctic Survey, um, Gaius from, the, uh, from Denmark, the Alfred Wagner Institute, um, the, the US Antarctic programs, USAP. Um, I imagine that they'll all do um, a big deployment somewhere in, in either in Antarctica or Greenland every year. Of course, there are also uh, the marine Antarctic uh, projects going on, so, uh, you know, Boaty McBoat face on board um, the, uh, the David Attenborough from the back British Antarctic Survey. Maybe a good indicator is if you look at the change in kind of the, the personnel uh, within the Antarctic station. So over winter, um, if you take the British Antarctic Survey's Rotherer base, then Rotherer maybe has a skeleton crew of 15 technicians who are keeping the station running and maybe five scientists who are doing, you know, dedicated research within the polar night. Um, the population of Rotherham maybe grows to 150 during the, the largest part of the, of the Antarctic field season. Um, if you take the, the US case, then um, the Scott Polar, uh, sorry, the uh, uh, McMurdo base, um, which is the American base down there, uh, has a maximum population of around 2,000. But um, a lot of countries have, uh, they maintain Antarctic bases. There's a, a Belgian base, Russian, German, French, uh, Japanese, all dotted around the periphery of the uh, Antarctic continent. The Russians have a station at Vostok, uh, which is uh, directly over Lake Vostok, and the Americans have a station at um, the South Pole. So there really is um, quite an active community going on down there, and um, lots of the, uh, the big kind of um, well-developed Antarctic programs will always maintain some sort of 
uh, research presence uh, in, in certainly in Antarctica. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, anyway, Adam, I think uh, we have um, tested your uh, <laughs> response. I've been very impressed with both the, the talk which you gave, which was very interesting, and I think very, um, very well pitched to the audience. Um, I also think you've uh, answered the, um, the questions in a very um, uh, interesting way. Um, so thank you very much once again. And um, if this was in a meeting room, I'd be saying, I'd like to thank the speaker once again. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adam, for your talk. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much for having me. Maybe another time I can take you on one of my desert expeditions instead. That sounds very good. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank right. you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye right. now. Goodbye.